Today we're focused on culturally sensitive addiction counseling. This is module three covering chapters 10 through 12 of your book, Learning the Language of Addiction Counseling. The objectives today are to first learn an overall perspective on multicultural counseling and some techniques to facilitate multicultural counseling, to become familiar with alcohol and drug use assessment, treatment, and aftercare issues as they relate to gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, spirituality, and age, including both adolescents and the elderly. Finally, to integrate an approach and techniques into assessment, treatment, and aftercare issues with regard to gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, spirituality, and age. Culture is a total of a group's life's way. So there's five approaches to culture. One is universal culture, being a human being. Two is ecological culture, the way we live our life. Three is country's culture. It's the rules, regulations, customs, and laws that must be followed according to your country. And regional cultures, which is the differences within the country. Finally, ratio ethnic, which includes the birth of your client or even yourself. The five cultural influences need to be considered as the therapist establishes the therapeutic relationship as well as the client's best interest. Culturally sensitive therapist has a four stage process of development. First, in many cases, the counselor is unaware of cultural differences. As a counselor becomes aware, they have an increased awareness of the client's culture from their own perspective, but may not be able to put themselves in the client's shoes or see it from the client's view. The counselor is hypervigilant in the third step or stage in cultural considerations, yet may not see how the client's behavior is connected to the culture. And finally, the counselor is more culturally sensitive by developing hypotheses about behavior based on the client's culture, but is also open to testing these hypotheses. So for example, if you have a client who is seeing you for alcohol addictions, and they come from a culture where alcohol is readily flowing at every single event that they go to, or they attend, that is an situation that will have to be addressed as part of the counseling. The therapist's goal is to build a bridge between the cultural differences of the counselor as well as the client. Multicultural counseling requires the counselor to have an awareness of self, others, and different cultures as well as to be flexible, open, perceptive, and willing to learn to build a bridge between these differences. The counselor does not give up their own value system, but rather stretches themselves. Or if they're having difficult stretch, stretching themselves, they refer clients when it is beyond personal limitations. And finally, we are all products of the cultures in which we were raised. As a therapist, we need to be able to work with those who are from different cultures than ourselves. Multicultural counseling has some important ideas to keep in mind. Number one, we cannot be all things to all people. A counselor may find it more comfortable to work with people of some cultures than with others. There is a danger that occurs when a counselor learns things about different cultures, and that would be stereotyping. We cannot assume that just because we know something about one particular person's experience within their culture, that that encompasses every single person within that same culture. Some will be more comfortable going beyond the limits of their personal culture than others. They're more willing to learn and try ways of living that are outside of personal cultural experiences. And this applies to both clients and clinicians. The therapist must determine the, the client's comfort level in trying something different from what they have known. For example, if you're working with somebody who um, has a strong family value of the children take care of the elderly in their family. 
and yet they're stressed out and it's leading them to addiction issues. It's discussing with that client how they feel about possibly looking at something like managed care or assisted care type locations and understanding that that may not be their choice or their option given their culture. And so then we have to look at other avenues to help that client cope better without going to addictions. So culturally sensitive addiction counseling looks at how addiction transcends cultural differences resulting in a subculture related to drugs. Alcohol, drugs, addictions in general, um, what, whether we're talking about gambling, um, alcohol, drugs, sexual addictions, eating disorders, any type of addiction, it defines who they are and what they do. So that group is a subgroup within the larger culture. There is a prevention program for urban middle schoolers that is culturally sensitive called Keeping It Real. Multicultural involves working with differences. The differences include ethnicity, sexual, spiritual, and many more. The emphasis is a difference between the counselor and the client. So what we have to do is we have to ask ourselves these areas and what approach gathers the most useful information, what helps the person stay sober. So assessing your knowledge base of client's culture. How do you need to assess in order that you get the most useful information in order to help your client stay sober? Assessing the client's view of their oppression. How does that affect them understanding why they use or why they have the addictive personality that they have and what helps them stay sober within that context. Assessing the client's and culture's view of use, abuse, and addiction. Again, as I said earlier, there are some cultures that drinking a lot or binging or using drugs or gambling, it's not seen as an addiction. So how does that client stay within their culture and still stay, stay sober from their addictive behaviors. And finally, assessing the dialogue barriers to the therapeutic alliance. What is the difference between you and the client that need to be addressed? That until you address it, you're not going to be able to help this client. You're not going to gain the useful information you need. And then therefore the client will not be able to have the opportunity to stay sober or they're less likely to stay sober. In the 1950s, uh, segregation became illegal. So counselors began focusing on assimilating the mainstream America using techniques that came from a mainstream perspective. Little to no success because cultural contexts were not considered. Then in 1964, the Civil Rights Act happened. There was an open discussion on how multicultural issues influence the therapeutic relationship, more sensitive to diversity issues, and it increased cultural tolerance. As we moved into the 1970s, multicultural views now includes women, the LGBT community, and disabled individuals. And as we move up to the 80s and 90s, there is a refinement of multicultural counseling to include regional, religious, social class, age, and resettlement differences. So as we're seeing this progression, multiculturalism is more than just ethnicity and race or sexual orientation. It encompasses being women. It encompasses our religious views. So as a Christian, working with somebody who is a non-Christian, no matter what their religious view is, as part of my multicultural counseling, I need to be sensitive to their views and work within their views to, again, go back to the previous slide, help them stay sober 
and learn the tools that they need to in order to incorporate that when we're done counseling. Also within the culturally sensitive addiction counseling, there are social environmental aspects. One being poverty. Is it situational poverty? Just a short time. Second, generational. Is this poverty something that has been learned and passed on from generation to generation? For example, um, a family who has to be on the welfare system and then their children end up on the welfare system and so forth and so on. Absolute poverty. Relative poverty. Urban and rural. Uh, typically, if you are living in the urban areas or the rural areas, you may have a little bit higher level of poverty. But again, we don't want to generalize that to everybody according to certain, um, because we know one little piece of information. Isms and prejudice. And this does uh, include oppression and it does include what people feel may not actually be occurring it's but it's what they feel it's what they know it's what they see in people's body language acculturation a normative behavior looking at normative behavior and american history of cultural diversity so our history does play a huge role in how we see each other right wrong or indifferent it does play a role there can also be a breakdown in communication. So depending on clients, counselors, experiences, it may affect the establishment of sincere communication between therapist and client. For example, if I have certain experiences working with a certain population, that is going to affect how I connect and build that therapeutic relationship. If that client has a certain situation that happened to them by a Caucasian female, that's going to cause a breakdown in our communication. And so we have to look at that. We have to approach those. Schematic. Schematic is the systems of knowledge a person has about certain areas. Example, types of people and situations. Now here's where it gets dangerous because when we have this little bit of knowledge, we tend to stereotype and we take that knowledge and we apply it to everybody within that group. It's overly simple, it's rigid, and it's generalized and not appropriate. There is a possibility for misdiagnosis when we have a breakdown in communication, especially whenever we start stereotyping. We also need to look at the counselor and the client's ethnocentrism. Are they aware of their own culture and the resistance within that? And finally, the therapist needs to actively listen to avoid typecasting others. Multicultural competence and multicultural orientation. Competence is a counselor who has awareness, knowledge, and skills that allow for work with others who are culturally different from self in meaningful, relevant, and productive ways. The framework for the culturally competent counselor includes knowledge, the cognitive. They are committed to change. They are constructive in how they handle their counseling skills. Cultural competence is best achieved by standing in the other person's shoes. One of the best things that I have learned throughout my years of private practice is if I place myself in my client's perspective, how would I want the response that I get from my therapist? What do I want to hear from me? If I'm struggling in XYZ area. Now, 
the issue that most therapists have with this is if we have not been through that situation. For example, if you've never had a struggle with addiction, maybe you've never touched a bit of alcohol or you've never tried a single drug or um, you've never had an eating disorder or, or you don't have a spirit, um, spirituality um, issues or you don't have... Um, issues with shopping. Um, and I could go on and on on this topic, but let's say you've not experienced any addiction issues. It's going to be a lot harder to put yourself in your client's shoes and the clients can pick up on that. So what you want to do is you want to spend time learning, listening, observing, taking in all that your client can share with you about their experiences so you can be more um, able to put yourself in the other person's shoes. So Sam HSA has 10 competencies of knowledge and skills. One, the client population background. We have to know their background we don't know their background, we're not going to get very far on why they are struggling in addictions. We have to know the clinical issues. Are there mental health issues on top of the addiction? Is it chronic pain? Is it that they are struggling spiritually? What are the issues that are going on in, addic in addition to the addiction? We have to know the appropriate treatment. Not every client is going to respond well to cognitive behavioral therapy. They might respond better to dialectical behavioral therapy. So it's being flexible into what is going to best help your client. Or looking at the agency that you are working within, what's their approach? What do they expect? What therapeutic treatment plan do they expect you to follow? Which leads into number four, role of the agency and provider. How does that affect your role? There are some therapeutic treatments that you are the primary agent for change. It is based off of what you say and do within the session. And then there are some where it is predominantly the client and you are just the, simply the guide. Communication skills, being able to communicate, being able to communicate on the difficult subjects. Uh, for example, um, when there's racism that occurs and you have a client that has experienced that, you may not know what that's like, but being able to communicate care and empathy with your client and letting them know that I'm here, I hear you. I may not get it, but I hear you. Quality assessments. Use assessments that are going to best benefit your client. Don't use an ass assessment that um, somebody who speaks predominantly Spanish and you give them an English-based assessment. They're not going to fare well on that. You want to give them a assessment that's in Spanish. Quality care and treatment plan formulation and implementation. So once you figure out what your treatment plan is, your assessment, and you've gained an idea of what's best for your client, then you want to develop a quality care and treatment plan formulation and you want to implement those. So if your client is wanting a spiritual aspect included because maybe they're struggling in that area, then you would include that in your treatment plan. If your client is not uh, spiritually minded, then you would leave that out of your treatment plan. Quality treatment provisions. Provide quality treatment. Um, the counselor's use of self and knowledge in the treatment. How do you view the situation? And that's going to affect how you approach the situation. 
And then finally, counselor's attitude that is respectful and open to working with others different from self. How open are you to working with somebody who may have a different belief system than you? Or maybe struggling with an addiction that you don't really fully understand or maybe agree with? Or has maybe um, gone through some isms and some prejudice that you don't understand either and you're trying to help. So be respectful and open. Listen. There's a lot of listening when you're working in multicultural um, situations. Counselors need to constantly work throughout their careers on studying and developing themselves in this area. Authentic, honest discussions, not politically correct discussions. Get it on the table rather than brushing over it. If it's the pink elephant in the room, discuss it. Counselors' way of doing their knowledge skills and necess um, skills necessary for working with diversity, augmented by a way of being, counselors' humility is combined with another orientation, oriented focus, which is considered multicultural orientation. Therapists need to exhibit cultural humility and asking questions when uncertain, expressing curiosity about clients' background experiences and worldview. There are two assessments that can be done to assess how culturally sensitive you are. One is the client's ability to rate their counselor. In this assessment, the client is, at, is evaluating you on your culturally humility um, ability. Are you respectful? Are you open to explore? Do you assume that you already know a lot? Are you considerate? Are you generally interested in learning more? Or do you act superior? Are you open to seeing things from the client's perspective? Or do you make assumptions about the client? Are you open-minded or are you a know-it-all? Do you think you understand more than they, your client does? Do you ask questions when you're uncertain? In the Cultural Com Competent Self-Report, you can go to asha.org and research multicultural self-reflection checklist and through that checklist you're able to see how you fare how you would rate yourself on many of those same issues that your client can rate you on general counseling suggestions provide a respectful open environmental particularly concerning cultural differences. You're flexible. You're an expert in the field of counseling, but not the client's lives. You establish a relationship of trust with the client. Do not pretend you know what you do not know. If you don't know, ask. Remember that a person can be a part of several cultural cultures at one time. Be willing to say, I do not know what it's like to be and you can fill in the blank. Ask your clients to teach you what you do not know. Do not create issues, but address them if they arise. Do not fight with people, but respond to their statements. Do not let things go by. Share your own experience of a communication breakdown if it occurs. Apologize when you are wrong. Learn how to deal with people who do not like you. That's a hard concept. Not everybody is going to like coming to see you. Not everybody is going to like your counseling approach. Learn how to process through that. That may be looking at how you're handling yourself in the counseling center, or it may be that the client's just not ready for change. They're not in that active stage of change yet. Turn to others counselors for support. Remember the commonalities among all people. 
So when we're assessing, treating, and looking at aftercare, we want to look at the addiction within the culture of the client. The framework of assessment is the general attitude, value, behavior connected to use, determination of criteria that defines use as a problem, the consequences for it, the responsibility for it, and how it may be enabled or hidden, when and where help is sought, as well as reinforces, reinforcers for change, culture-specific relapse and consequences for it, who is thought of as successful and when an intervention, intervention is successful. So what does success look like once you work through the issues? Framework should be kept in mind as gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, spirituality, and age. Our addicted clients are part of the universal culture. Treat with care and respect. They're part of the ecological culture. How has this impacted um, their ability for trust and survival? And if they don't have a huge amount of trust and they have a lot of survival skills, maybe they had to live on the streets for a little bit, that's going to spill over to the treatment process. They may not trust you at first and they may be in survival mode. Look at the rules, regulations, customs, and laws of their countries. That affects the treatment. And then again, racio-ethnic culture. Our birth can impact the entire treatment process. Isms experienced by the client may make recovery harder, however not to be used as an excuse. We recognize that this happens, but we cannot lean on it as an outlet for, oh, it's okay for me to go and do retail therapy um, because, you know, I get treated like this. Compensate accountability needs to be a practice. I'm sorry, compassionate accountability needs to be practiced. Counselor needs to name the wrong of the ism with the client and address it as part of the recovery process. Part of the reason why some people may be addicted is because they have had prejudices that we would not understand. The client unfortunately needs to examine how to work with the ism in recovery as a part of the relapse prevention plan. Unfortunately we cannot change other people and it's helping the client understand how do we work within a society that is has major flaws within this area. And so we look at the inherently wrong, unjust, and yet cannot be allowed to take the client under. Multicultural counseling is complicated by addiction. It does not make recovery impossible or improbable. So just because you have an addicted client who has been through um, multicultural isms or prejudices or um, put down for some, some way, maybe because they're a woman, they got put down. The counselor is even more committed to assisting this client in developing internal and external resources to address the reality of the discrimination the client may or does experience. So we just completed looking at multicultural competencies in working with addictions. Now we're going to switch gears and look at the personal and professional development of the counselor. To understand some core ethical dilemmas and general ways to approach them, to learn guidelines for testifying in court, to develop a perspective and approaches on working in difficult systems, to understand general approaches to working with addicted individuals, and to develop a broad perspective on self-care. Your terms are ethical principles, which guides the behavior of the counselors. This is the direct moral and value-based decisions that affect the counseling process. Or moral decisions, concrete decisions that are made in a situation based on our values and have important meaning. Finally, laws formalize moral decisions of a culture. To avoid ethical dilemmas, we want to inform the client of limitations. Always act in the best interest of the client. Work within professional competency boundaries. 
when needed, be able to explain the rationale for your professional decisions and behaviors. Consult with other professionals and stay current with professional and legal guidelines. Also, understand the definition of multiple relationships, dual relationships, protecting confidentiality, respect autonomy, knowing supervisory responsibilities if you're gonna supervise. Identify the client and your role with that client. Documenting. Practice within certain areas of, in areas of expertise. Knowing the difference between abandonment and termination. Basing professional opinions and evaluations on evidence. Being accurate in your billing. So dual relationships. Looking at what are the different roles I have with this client. Are these roles conflicting with one another or potentially confusing or damaging for my client? What is the least number of roles I can feasibly have with this client? Am I trying to have my personal needs met with my client? Is there anyone else in the recovery community who can meet the needs of my client? Is a referral to another addictions counselor necessary? Should I consult with another professional? Am I trying to treat someone with whom I have a strong personal relationship or with one of their family members? And many times we're asked about disclosure or not to disclose. These are things that you want to look at. Is it going to be helpful to your client or would it hurt your client? Would disclosing information facilitate client trust? Would disclosing information facilitate the client's informed choice to work with me. Would I disclose this information to all of my clients in similar situations? Now, if I'm not going to do that, then I probably don't need to disclose. When we document, most uh, locations that you're going to be at use a computer-based documentation system. For example, I use a program called Simple Practice. And there are varying approaches to how you do your notes. Um, there's SOAP notes, there's STAP notes, DAP. Um, what you want to do is you want to look at the agency that you're working with and see how they want you to do notes. And you want to make sure you have statements that say client said or client stated or client reported so that it puts emphasis on the client's perspective. You want to write enough information so that you know what's going on for the next session or if somebody else had to come in behind you, they would be prepared, but not to create, increase liability. Keep in mind who may be reading the chart notes, including courts. So you want to make sure it's grammatically che um, in check and you want to make sure the spelling is good. Remember, if it's not written down, it did not happen. Make notes of everything. Even whenever you just have a five minute conversation with your client, make a documentation note. When you're asked to testify in court, you have to look at the process of addiction and be able to explain this, the development and the recovery. You wanna look at four major um, models, moral theories, a view of the um, let's say alcoholic as a degenerate who is morally weak and should be treated with punishment or the psychological model psychodynamic personality and behavior there's also sociocultural models the problems situated containing social forces and contexts that need to be addressed medical models the addiction is a physiological dysfunction biopsychosocial. They account for both biogenetic traits and psychosocial factors. How biological aspects impact psychological aspects and then impact social aspects of a person in an ongoing and interactive manner. While there is no firm agreement on the cause of addictions and the proven method of recovery, the disease model is seems to be the most widely used and respected. The key elements are loss of control over during drinking and the progression of the disease, which could very well end in death. Another widely chosen model is the um, harm reduction model. 
It encourages reduction of harm to self and others by uh, resulting from the drug use. It's a pragmatic approach discussing harm being done to the individual and society. Best approach. Choose a model that you are most comfortable with or that your organization recommends, including the one supported by the state in which you are testifying. An expert testimony um, has a choice on how they're going to handle a, a subpoena. They can testify, risk contempt by refusing to testify, or explore other uh, strategies such as appeal for pri privileged communication, testify in the chambers with the judge, or cooperate with the client's lawyers. When testifying, be thorough and use psychometric assessment instruments approved by the state in which the testimony is made. You want to look at the strengths and limitation of the drug testing method used and be able to explain that. You want to be able to respond to questions about a client's potential relapse. Respond by com commenting on behavioral indications of abstinence. How long have they been clean? Watch other individuals testify. Find out what the court expects. Be knowledgeable and have current professional literature. Obtain informed consent from the client. That should actually be done at the first session. Talk with the attorney representing the client. Prepare testimony with the attorney or an experienced colleague and dress up professionally. Look confident in court, but do not appear over prepared. Relax while testifying. Listen carefully to the attorneys the judge went on the stand and take your time to process through and give a clear response. Do not take notes to the stand. Take a contact sheet with general dates and descriptions to the stand. Provide testimony based on therapeutic knowledge. What did you observe in your client? What conversations with the client or sign and significant others happened? Admit to not knowing an answer. Be brief at cross-examination. Avoid arguments with opposing counselor. And just some additional guidelines, avoid using technical terminology. Direct comments to the judge or jury. Be aware that there is not a guarantee of witness immunity, although generally there is witness immunity. Remember the importance of being objective, not being drawn to the advocate role. So when you're working in a difficult uh, system, you have to look at your own wounds and how they can impact your client. So when you're working, looking at that, you want to address your history of emotional pain. The unintended meeting of persons unfamiliar with each other and how that can have a pin an impact on personal's person's life. Um, the lack of family, community, and tradition. So the systems in your life. The three aspects of operating in a system, in a larger system, is powerful power differentiation any losses that you've experienced, and discrepancy. So when we have a critical incident, there's two possible responses. You have the critical authority response. This results in more pain for the counselor and probably an increase in the isolation, vulnerability, self-neglect, and competitiveness. Then you have the compassionate author authority response. Painful incident is compassionately discussed with the counselor resulting in a reduction on pain and an increase of trust. So when you have problems in the system that you work in, you have to decide, do I leave or do I stay? Can I work within the system? Next, we're going to look at working with addicts. In working with addicts, you have to know your own history. Do you have current or past drug use? 
if you do have current, you need to look at how that's going to impact your professional duties. You may need a self-help group for yourself. And in which case you want to look at what type of group am I comfortable with? And do I want them to know I'm a counselor? What type of negative impact might I experience professionally? What types of limits must I put on the sharing that do, especially given the profession? How will I set limits on the time I will listen to others? And how can I make sure that my own needs are being met? You want to obtain therapy to address personally unresolved issues. We have to have the knowledge of our own limitations. Should I give up the use of mood altering substances in order to work with addicted clients? Can I understand the addictive issues with mood altering substances if I continue to use them? If I continue to use mood altering substances, how will I respond in situations where I meet addicted clients and I am under the influence of the substances? Your danger zones. Have your own time and recovery process before counseling others. You have a potential for relapse because of the environment that you're in. Treat others using the same manner that you personally received can be negative. Attendance of health self-help groups can lead to a potential dual relationship if your client is also attending that same group. Now, if you've never used or you do you don't feel like you have an addiction to um, any kind of substance or any issues, you're going to have difficulty understanding a client's struggle. And the client's resistance and bias working with you is going to be very real. Finally, looking at self-care. Possible stress outcomes, burnout, compassion fatigue, and vicarious trauma. So when we're going to self-care, we need to examine our counseling philosophy. Progress is not perfection. Be responsible for the effort, not the outcome. Be aware of leisure activities where you can lose yourself. Mind care. Be aware of healthy eating, sleeping, and exercise. Body care. Incorporate journaling and, re and reading for pleasure. Psychological. Be aware of social circles that do not see you as the therapist, but just as a person. Your emotional needs. Be aware of those activities that keep your spirit alive, your interest, spiritual needs. And finally, looking at some of these questions, where do I spend time physically at work? And is that space comfortable for me physically, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually? Do I take time to eat a meal? And if I do, is it without interruption? Do I visit in person, phone, or email, or text, or some other form? with people I like with whom I work? Do I leave work to do something to break up the routine? Walk, receive a massage, shop, etc. Can meetings be held in a different location that still invite professional behavior but are more relaxing?